We'll start in Hebrews chapter 3. Actually, Hebrews 3, put your finger there, and then jump over to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, tonight I'm talking about the, uh, the voice of God, and uh, just to let you know a little bit about what we're, we're doing, um, just been considering, evaluating our services here, and just the, the, um, the purpose for why we do what we do. One of the things about uh, anything we do, we have to have a reason for why we do it. Um, Hebrews, uh, while you're turning to Hebrews chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 1 to get started, um, when we consider why we go to Wednesday night, we have to remember that it's not just to go one more time. And so we know that the early church would meet frequently. In fact, how frequently was the early church meeting? Daily. Daily. Every single day. Now, does it mean that every single person in the church met every day? Maybe, maybe. The, the point is, it was well, seen as a whole, though. And so, um, so even if certain things were not done by everybody, it was still that the church as a whole, they, they were involved in certain things. And so, um, so anyways, uh, considering that, the, the meeting, uh, when you would find out what they were doing, is they, they had actions that they were involved in. For instance, there was even the fellowship aspect about breaking bread. I believe that there's a communion side to that, but I believe also that there's a part where they are breaking bread, like they're literally eating with each other. So there's that, because there's addressing a number of physical things together at that time. And so, um, but then they are in prayer. So that's one of the things they did. Church people prayed. That's what they did. And so we're thankful for that. You see that pattern? Um, but then um, one of the things that would happen, though, is that there would be a special occasions which they would meet together as well. For instance, Peter gets thrown in jail. The church meets. Let's pray for Peter to get out. It's a special occasion. Now, it's possible that they were meeting like, oh, it's Thursday. W wasn't Peter supposed to be there? Yeah, he's in jail. We'll just go pray for him while we're here, and he's not. So, so maybe that's the possibility. But the point is that it seems that they've gathered together for that purpose uh, within that text. And so... Anyways, that being said, there's, there's a reason for why we meet together. Sunday, we know, is, um, is what the church did, and this layout within the scriptures. Um, but there's not, you're not going to find a verse of scripture that says on Wednesday you're supposed to meet together as a church. Um, but, but here's what we do know. As, as a church, one of the things that we have done is we've added a time in the middle of the week where we do meet together for multiple purposes as a tool to be a help to you. Now, so instead of gathering from house to house in different places, uh, we, we come together one place, and praise God, we have our own building. That, that's, that's great. It's a huge, huge blessing. Um, we may not always have our own building, but we do, and so praise God for that. But, um, but with that, it's one time in the middle of the week. The history around Wednesday night services, though, were centered around revival and around prayer. In fact, they were literally called the midweek prayer service. And so eventually, over time, they became better known as uh, midweek Bible studies, and then uh, now it's just the midweek service. And so we call it, I call it the midweek service for one big reason. If, if we minimize um, the midweek service a little bit more, I notice that people take it less, less seriously and uh, just less important. And so, uh, so anyways, we want it to be, it's an important thing. And, uh, and anyways, with that, um, it is important, but, um, but I have goals in what I'm doing when, whenever I'm preaching. Uh, Wednesday night, I, one of my goals is to be able to give you some exhortation. And uh, when we do a lot of study, like a little deep, deep study, which is nothing wrong with that, uh, sometimes we kind of get lost in the study of it. Anybody get lost in the study of it? You get caught up in the facts? I do. I get caught up in that. And, uh, and there's, we understand that all Scripture is profitable, and it gives a list of those things that are profitable. <laughs> one second. <coughs> I did it. Yes. Thank you. All right. Dan, Dan, he's, he's the one. He's like, just let it go. I'm like, all right, I'm going to try this. We're going to just do some shampoo in here. Um, but anyways, um, it worked. It worked. Um, anyways, I, I'm, t I'm telling you, brother, I've been practicing. I'm just like, I'm going to get this sneezing thing down. And he's telling me, you can do it. I'm like, all right, I need an exhortation in church. Um, so anyways, uh, so the middle week of the service, one of the things is that I want to encourage us in is, is, is um, not that we're not going to study the Bible anymore. We're still going to study the Bible. But I really desire for an element of exhortation to prop you up in the week and emphasize it specifically in your personal walk with God. Um, all, all aspects about our walk with God are personal, by the way, uh, even in the church sense. I mean, it's obviously in the church, but personal beings in this church doing the same thing. But in the middle of the week, my goal is some exhortation to get you through the rest of the week. So emphasize some of those things. And so, so anyways, um, may not be very different in your mind and what you're hearing. For me, it gives me a little bit of direction. But the goal is to emphasize those things in our walk with God um, that, that need us to, you know, that God draws us closer in. Um, so, so Sunday nights, we'll, we'll 
probably uh, keep and, and add some heaviness in regards to the study side of things. Um, Wednesday night we'll have a lot more of the devotional nature of things. Uh, again, it's not a devotion, right? It's still preaching. We believe in preaching. Um, but, but with that, um, just kind of giving you where I'm at on things um, in study. All right, so anyways, with that, um, one of the things I encourage you to do as well, if you have questions, uh, feel free to bring them up to me, and we'll try to address those on Wednesdays. And so questions that come up during the week, we'll, we'll kind of try to bring up on Wednesdays to answer questions that kind of, um, not necessarily an interactive lecture, but one that throughout the week I'm able to compile questions and bring them up. Um, all right, so you're in Hebrews 3. You've got a finger there or one of your bookmarks, and you're going to go over to Genesis chapter number 2. And in fact, you're in Genesis 2. Go ahead and turn one page back to Genesis chapter 1. Let's on the same page. Look at the very first verse. In the beginning. Now, we understand something about this. When God's going to tell us in the beginning, that means something from the very get-go is vitally important. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It establishes his authority. It establishes his ownership. It establishes the fact that he had a plan. Verse number two, and earth was without form and void and darkness was upon, upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Notice this in verse number three, we're going to see, the first, we're going to see some interaction from God and, and God said, let there be light and there was light. Now you'll notice from the very beginning, there, there gives an observation about the creation that God makes, his moving upon the face of the waters and then there is something that he does, he says. This work that's done by God is that he says something. He said. So this was in the past, obviously. Obviously, way, way back in the past. Back to the beginning of the past. And so, it's so all the way back then. That he said, let there be light. Now go over to chapter number two. So we have the first words spoken by God. You can very much make a case that Genesis 1-1 would be the first words spoken by God since Genesis 1-1 is God's word, right? But as far as him speaking, narrating what he's saying, we see that in chapter number 2. Um, sorry, chapter, uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 3. So anyways, in chapter number 2, look down in verse number 15. God has made man at this point. And uh, in verse 15 of chapter 2, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So right at the very beginning, the very first conversation, the very first time that God speaks to man is recorded in Genesis chapter 2. And so these are the words of God to man. So we're still talking about something that, that's understandable. Now the point is this that I'm making, that God communicates. God communicates. Communication is, is really the bedrock of relationships. It's the core of relationships, I should say. Um, obviously, we understand the love and, and trust. And I mean, there's several things that we can line up. But the reality is even acts of service are not understood unless there's some form of communication involved in that, right? For instance, some of you are, um, and I, I won't ask for, for a raise of hands, but let's just say, perhaps some of you are, or you find it more difficult to express emotions verbally. True? We know that. Uh, it's either you or somebody else. Um, so maybe there's a struggle. And uh, so that happens. So that happens. But the point is, like, you can do something. Perhaps you would excel in some way to demonstrate that affection for somebody by doing something else, acts of service or, or words of affirmation or quality time, things like that. People talk about the five love languages. I understand that. But the issue is that there's some element of communication which is done. God communicates with people, and the way he does so is by speaking to them. By speaking to them. And so he does so from the very beginning. He made things work by speaking. He addresses God commanding and setting directions, his expectations, the consequences, the warning, all right there in the very first time that he speaks to man. I mean, he gives him a whole bunch of stuff right then and there. Now, we understand that took place. Were there more words? Possibly because we know that there is a continued relationship. There is a uh, consistency to man walking with God in the garden in the cool of the evening. And, and so we understand that that's uh, in the cool of the day. While we know that's been happening, there's a lot of words that are not recorded then, isn't there? Because they were in that fellowship. So there is communication from the very beginning. God intends to communicate. And this is exactly what he does. He wants fellowship. He wants to give us commandments. He wants to give us direction. He, he desires to be our God or such that we should acknowledge him as our God in relationship, uh, that we would be his people, he our God. 
And so anyways, this is what we find here in the, in the first and second chapter. Now, uh, in verse number 18, and God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me. And so we talk about the, the creation, the making of the woman. Now, go down to chapter number 3. And we know the story in, John, in uh, Genesis chapter 3. Chapter 3, man has fallen, right? They were told one thing. You know, so I see those fail memes every now and then. You had one job, and uh, that was Adam. Adam, you got one job. Actually, he's got a lot of jobs. Just don't do one thing, like one thing you're supposed to avoid. Well, anyways, with that, he fails at that one thing. He takes the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, which, by the way, we don't know what that fruit was. It has nothing to do with the message except for the fact it's not in the Bible, and so we, we can go ahead and just say we don't know. Uh, I used to think, well, it's got to be an apple. Why? Because that's what all the paintings say it is. It's an apple. And so, uh, and then somebody brought up a very good point. Again, this is just an extra. Um, guy said, it must be the fig. It must be a fig. Why? Because they put on fig leaves. And if you find out you're naked, you're probably not going to run to the other side of the garden to get fig leaves. And so um, you might if that's the biggest leaves available. <laughs> and so I'm not really sure. But the point is that um, it's, it's a special type of tree. There's only one of them. And so that's, that's a special type of fruit. So, so don't think it's any of those. Now, now, that being said, um, we get to chapter 3, and in chapter 3, they, they do fall. And when man falls, this is amazing. When, man's, when man falls, look at verse number 8. Verse number 8, so they've gone and hid after they sewed these fig leaves together. Verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden um, in, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so right there at the beginning, we see the first evangelist, don't we? And so who's, who's out there reaching for the lost person? God himself. God himself goes out there, goes out into the garden, calls for him, beckons him to come, tries to find out what's, or finds out what's, obviously he knows what's going on, but he's doing so, he's reaching out. And in so doing, we understand what's taking place here is that he is reaching the lost Adam, the last man that's there. And so very, very powerful, obviously, there. Fellowship with God was broken. God's the one that restores, and the way he does so is he speaks. He speaks to get him. In the speaking, when God's voice was heard, God's voice was feared. God was feared. What, by the way, it's consistent in the scriptures in a number of places where people would hear the voice of God and be terrified. For instance, you go to the book of Exodus, which we're not going to turn there right now. But in the book of Exodus, when they're standing there at the Mount Sinai and they're receiving the law of God, they're hearing the voice of God. And they said, no more. We don't want to because they are shaking. They're afraid of the voice of God. And they're saying that nobody can hear the voice of God and live. And so they're terrified of the voice of God. It's a scary thing. But before Genesis chapter 3, man was not afraid of the voice of God. Yeah, I had no reason to fear that in regards to the relationship. There was nothing tainted there. And so communication with God was exactly as it was supposed to be. And so we know, we know that God wants to communicate. Now I say this, that when we come to the communication aspect, that God wants you to hear his voice. We have a, a mindset about God and by the way, when I say, let me just go ahead and preface this. When I say hear his voice, I'm not suggesting that you are going to hear this audible, uh, you know, Daryl. You know, just it's not that kind of thing that's going to tell you what to do. We're talking about as far as what the scripture gives us. And he's going to give us several indications of what that's like in the scriptures. There are occasions which the prophets of God would have received words, words that they were supposed to say. Uh, the very scriptures, by the way, were the words that God wanted, the very, very words. For instance, we would say um, that, in fact, we don't say it. God says it. The, the scriptures, the word of God was given by inspiration of God. What does it mean to be inspired? literally means that they are given by the breathing of God, which, by the way, is another way of saying speaking, all right? So when you, when you breathe, for instance, when you speak, you're breathing, right? You, you, you're letting air out and uh, usually not letting air in unless you're speaking too fast and <laughs> up to talk this way as well. But, but you're breathing now, so that inspiration has the fact that God's word is literally coming out from his own breath. This is directly from God. So God, what he's pointing out, is that it's sourced not by man's speech. I hear that all the time. Oh, well, man came up with those words. No, he didn't. This is God's word. 
And so we know it was given by inspiration. That inspiration has been preserved, so we still have God's inspired word. Praise God that we know exactly what he said. Now, knowing that he wants to communicate with his children, with his creation, in this relationship right with him, we understand something, that this is not something that we have to be afraid about because we have that relationship that's been restored like Adam previously had. Now, there's obviously things that get in the way, but we're going to examine those in a few, in, in a, with, with a few of these verses. Now, you're in Hebrews. Go over to Hebrews. All right, so we start off there in, um, in Genesis. Hebrews chapter number 3. Um, knowing that he's going to address the idea of, of his, his word, his voice, um, no, you'll fr- find frequently that his voice and his word are going to be rather synonymous. Not exactly identical, but overlapping tremendously, where if you know you hear his word, you have heard his voice, but his voice may not necessarily be in just his word. I'll explain that, what I mean by that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting special revelation, okay? That's not, that's not at all what I'm going to encourage here. All right, so Hebrews chapter number 3, look down to verse number 12. Verse number 12. All right. I'm in the, yeah, okay. It says, uh, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, notice who he's speaking to. The first three words, take heed who? Brethren. So brothers and sisters, those within that family relationship with God, God is your father, you've been saved, says, brethren, be careful because you have a possibility of something happening to you. So he's, he's cautioning you something, which, which, by the way, that means you today, right? He, he's cautioning you. You can do something bad. In fact, he says something very unique. It's not just bad. He says, lest there be in any of you. Notice it's not about any of you, but it says in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So the, so the evil is not because you've just thought of bad things, but it was stemmed in, in the sourced in, the fact there's unbelief in your heart. Now, what, what aspect of unbelief? He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about a, a believing on God. The rest that we have, literally the context of that is, is that God has fulfilled all this stuff, and, and you're having doubts in what he has promised and provided through salvation. And if you have that unbelief, you, you can have issues that you're going to be up and down. Now, now, perhaps if you've had times where you've doubted your salvation before, my, just about every Christian I've met, not all of them, I've had a handful of people that said no, that they've never struggled. But if you've had those doubts of whether or not you're really saved, he's saying, look, you're, you're, you're in a heart of unbelief, which is evil. Now, here's the idea of evil. The word evil in the, in the New Testament especially is, is unusual because we think of the word evil as, like, maniacal, all right? So, like, an evil scientist, a, an evil dictator, an evil mass murderer. And you're just looking at the person who's just like, ah, oh, they're, they're terrible. Now, what's in common about all of those is that all of those evil people do things that cause damage, all right? So it's not just like, well, you have bad stuff in mind, but literally evil is one that has a consequence that is bad, all right? So evil has action involved in it. You're doing something. So here's what he's pointing to. Uh, in the damage that is caused, for instance, um, the, the days, they, they have evil, is what the Bible talks about, I'm not worrying about what, what shall be in the morrow, because uh, the Bible describes that sufficient uh, is the evil, right, for like for today. We have plenty, we got plenty of bad stuff going on right now. But the idea here is like you have to deal with problems that can really devastate. And so when we talk about evil, we're addressing, yes, there, there's something bad, but it's damaging. It's a bad thing in that way. And so, uh, so knowing this, that there are things that you will do because of doubts that would enter into your mind about God himself. And so how does this take place? All right? Is it just because, like, well, I just, you know, I decided to change what I believe about the gospel? Not, not so. In fact, we'll look at the next verse. Verse number 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ in holding the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Look at verse 15. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So we know from the Old Testament that these, um, these individuals, Israel, were given opportunity and they provoked God. In fact, it speaks about this earlier in the chapter. Go back, um, go back to verse number 8, I believe. No, not verse number 8. Yeah, verse number 8. Um, actually, verse number 7, I'm sorry. Uh, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden 
uh, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. In the wilderness. And so we know that um, with Israel, just a quick quick history, not to, uh, I don't want to like shame you saying that you don't know what's going on. I, I believe you guys know the story. But when it comes to Israel, we understand the children of Israel were living in Egypt. Uh, and anyways, they are redeemed out of Egypt. They're taken out there. They're given a law. And uh, from this, they've just said, we're going to be your people. We'll do anything you say. What, whatever you say, we will do. And so from there, they immediately complain. In fact, not only do they complain, while the details are being given out about the law, they throw a party. And they're, they're, they make a false idol, and they're worshiping that false idol, and they're claiming that that's the God. Uh, they complain when they're traveling out in the wilderness, and so they're doing all these things um, and did not enter into Canaan's rest. They did not go all the way there because of what was taking place, that they literally said, God, anything you want. After God had brought them out, they don't believe him. And so what he's addressing here is that in this passage of scripture that the hardening of their heart was not just because they just have a lot of bad intentions, but because even though they were brought out, even though God had done much, even though God had given provision as far as what to do, they still had unbelief about things. What kind of stuff? What, was it about everything? No, not necessarily. In fact, when they make the, the, um, the golden image, um, the, the calf, that they shaped it, detailed it, that Aaron did, um, in that, they said that was the God that did this. In other words, they know they were redeemed out. They know it was God that did it, and they were just making some changes about who they thought God was. That's a pretty big deal, by the way. God says, no, that's one of the Ten Commandments. And so anyways, I guess they violated multiple commandments with that. But the point on that is that they're, they're doing certain things they shouldn't be doing. The other part has to do with the fact that they were not trusting God for his provision. God said, you do this, I'll provide for you. Do this, I'll protect you. You do this, I'll direct you. And unfortunately, they didn't believe him. And so when they then didn't believe him about this, now they know that the relationship they're in, they've been made that nation. But they were said, as a nation, if you disobey, bad consequences. And so they would not enjoy the good consequences or the benefits of obeying because of unbelief. And so where's, where's the unbelief? That God would provide, that he would protect, and that he would direct. And so they would, if you look at the wilderness issues, they struggle with all of those. In fact, one of the things, they don't go straight through direct line from Egypt all the way to Canaan. Why does God say so? Because of the Philistines. He said, you're not ready for that yet. They're going to fight battles, but the Philistines are all up there, and God says, you're not ready yet. You've got, got to get you ready. You've got to get you ready. And so, um, so anyways, with that, there, there's uh, issues about protection. There's issues about provision. Uh, for instance, we know that God provides manna for them. They were complaining. Uh, we know that God provides water, and they had been complaining. Uh, God provides even meat through the, the birds that were, flo that were provided daily and, because they, they were complaining. Right, so they have a daily, they have a consi consistent thing where they're complaining, but they're complaining according to what Hebrews is telling us here is because of the unbelief that's there. And so the issue here, he's saying, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Um, now, now, you notice in verse number eight, it says, harden not your hearts. Don't do, in other words, it's a decision that you're making, and you can make a decision to not harden your hearts if you'll do what you're supposed to. And so, um, so if you'll go a couple, couple things about this. Um, the, the speaking of God, the speaking of God. All right, so in, uh, in uh, chapter number three, verse number seven and verse number 15, uh, verse number seven again, just for a reminder, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice. So the Holy Spirit speaking, and this is provided such that we would hear his voice. You can hear. Go down to verse 15. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. And so you have this, this taking place. He's saying, look, you can hear what God is saying, the voice of God. And so the, how does God speak to us? Number one is scriptures, scriptures. Uh, we understand that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Uh, when we consider what God is telling us, and I'll tell you that most of the time, uh, in fact, we can, we can say with some consistency that all the time it's through the scriptures. And I'll explain how the other parts work, but we're going to emphasize specifically through the scriptures. The Bible. Um, there, there's no leading and there's no speaking that God does to us that will ever contradict his word. So we were to say something, for instance, just to give you a, a snapshot of where we're going. We're talking about the speakers, the preachers, teachers, things like that. Um, if, if they're leading you and we're talking about the voice of God, it will never contradict the scriptures. The Bible is where we get, where we hear the, the voice of God. 
And so um, let me encourage you a couple things about this. Always read your Bible. Always read your Bible. How often should you read your Bible? The more, the better. You know, we, we are so easily caught away by everything else, and, and we don't like to do two big things in our Christian life. We don't like to read the Bible, and we don't like to pray. And, in fact, what happens is we will do those things under certain circumstances. For instance, prayer. We are drawn to prayer. When? When things get desperate, and then we really need to pray. Then we want to pray. Boy, because we absolutely need it. Do you, you think that maybe God's trying to get your attention, and that's why you see that need, that compulsion to pray? Because that's important. What about things are going good? Why, why pray? I don't need anything. I talk to people all the time. You need prayer about anything? I'm good. I'm good. Well, maybe, like, there's an aspect about that, that, like, there's not a special request I want you praying about. And we just don't have a nice way of saying it, like, nothing for you to pray about. Um, but, but I understand the sentiment, though, is also like, no, there's everything. In fact, I've heard it before. Everything in my life is going great. Okay. Great. Well, I, I hope that you want it to continue that way, you know? The, the goal is like, oh, it's fine. When something comes up again, then I'll pray. Well, we're, we're not led to pray. Why? Because it's spiritual. We don't like spiritual things. We, we avoid it. In fact, the idea here is that while you, are, um, you have been made alive, you have a spirit within you that's alive, you also have the flesh that wars against your members, that, that wars against your spirit. So you don't like, you by your flesh side doesn't like that kind of thing. The other part is the Bible reading. When it comes to Bible reading, we have so many issues with Bible reading that we have to translate Bible reading into another purpose. For instance, we may do it for the sake of enjoyment. You, you can enjoy certain things. And so what happens, and by the way, if you, if you might say, oh, no, that's not me at all. Are you, reading, are you reading the Bible more frequently in certain areas because that's what you enjoy the most? Right, and so um, for instance, uh, if you get a, a certain certain hobby horse, we've all got them. We've all got them. Every single one of us. Mine just changes frequently, but we've all got them, and we'll pursue that hobby horse, and that's what we read the most about. Why, why are you reading the Bible? Is it because you're wanting to hear the voice of God, or is it because you want to know more stuff? Can we say this? This is a type of entertainment, right? Uh, for instance, uh, the History Channel is a type of entertainment. I say, oh, no, no, it's history. The only people that don't think History Channel is entertainment is uh, people that are trying to either defend it or people that hate history. <laughs> right? So like, hey, I'm learning something. Uh, it's not entertaining at all. No, you it, enjoy learning things because you enjoy learning things. That's, that's a part of it. And so, um, so anyways, with that, but we be, make it a form of entertainment where we pursue that for the sake of knowledge. Um, perhaps we say, pursue it for other forms of entertainment. For instance, you may really like the story of Jesus. It impresses you. This is important. But again, become something of entertainment instead of an opportunity to hear what God has for you. And by the way, that means we should be reading all of scriptures, uh, all, all, all of the Bible. And so, um, so read, let me encourage you to read the Bible regularly, daily, and thoroughly. There's 783,137 words, I'm pretty sure, in the, uh, in the Bible. And so, um, so if I'm wrong, you can correct me, but I, I think that's accurate. Now, with that, um, do you realize that a first grader, as far as a normal reading ability, is between five, uh, 53 and 118 words? So if you were to take the 53 words, the bottom of the regular first grade reading level, and read all 783,000 of those words in the Bible, it would take you 267 days approximately. And so, um, so here's the thing. You can do so um, by, by reading, uh, I, I apologize, 267 hours. And so I'm saying if you read it one hour a day for uh, 267 days, you'd read it. Now you might say, well, that's, that's a long time. I, I mean, I only have... Uh, 14, 16, 18 hours of awake time in my day, and I took one hour to Bible reading, that would be very hard. And I get that, but most of you are reading beyond a first grade reading level, right? Most of us, most of, not everybody, but, I, but most of us are, which means, let's just jump up to fourth grade. An average fourth grader can read about 150 words per minute. And so, um, so that might say, well, that's a lot. You'd be surprised. I mean, it, that's a normal speaking type thing. And so if you can do that, do you realize that you can read the Bible through at a fourth grade average reading speed? Not like they're busting it out as fast as they can. I'm talking normal fourth grade reading speed of 150 words that you can read the entire Bible through four times in one year reading 20 minutes a day. Okay, and we're like, oh, I just don't have time. Oh, it's really hard. Or, and, and then we're like, oh, you know, I just read this whole Bible through. 
Listen, it takes a while. Now, by the way, I'll say this. Reading at a fourth grade speed of 150 words per minute could be challenging for you if you're like, you're not used to reading volumes. And so maybe you read it slower for the sake of you trying to retain more. So let's just slow it down. Slow, I mean, slow it down to, to again, to, you know, less than that. And, and so um, to half of that reading speed, which is fairly slow. And that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but with that, that means you're still reading the Bible through twice in a year, right? Here's what's missing consistency. Oh, I just can't do it. No, no, you just won't do it. Different. This is different, right? Because what's happened is we have other reasons for why we, we don't do it. Um, here, here's why. Um, because of a few reasons, and I, for, I wrote these reasons down that we don't have them. Okay, number one, we're too busy. We are too busy for reading the Bible, so we don't read the Bible. Um, and by the way, as Americans, we, we are so proud of how busy we are, and the reality is if you don't have time for the Bible, you're too busy. If you're too busy for the Bible, you're too busy. You need to take something off your schedule. Now, that means something. A, some of you, that means you're going to lose money, and it's worth it. It's worth losing money because, yes, overtime is going to pay you X dollars, but if overtime is going to cost you this amount of, amount of time in Bible reading, you're like, oh, it's only one day every week, a couple times a day, whatever, you're going to see taken away, and you're not going to read the Bible. You're too busy. We fill every moment of our every day. When we fill these moments, the Bible is not one of those moments we fill it with. Uh, number two, we're tired. We're, we're tired. Uh, when we think about being tired, one of the issues is that with our business busyness, we do not use our energy for Bible reading because, number three, wrong priorities. When we consider the Word of God, we describe them as more, than our, uh, more important, more vital than our necessary food. Right, so this is what it's described as. And so if we're taking it in, the reality is if it was that important, should, you should be willing then to have a priority where, you know, I, I, I would go do that, but I would get in the way of my Bible reading. You know, hey, I'd, I'd love to hang out, but you know, I, I, I won't read my Bible. Now, by the way, you don't have to say it to people, you know, I'd, I'd love to come over to your house for dinner, but that's my Bible reading time, and so, you know, I, and I read my Bible for seven hours a day, so you're not going to fit in there. Um, we don't have to brag about it, all right? You can, you can do this without telling everybody about it, that there's certain things you can't do. That means you can't stay on the phone too late. How do we stay on our phone? Every way, possibly. Your phone's everything. Some of y'all would do really well to shut this off. In fact, if you're struggling with your Bible reading, let me encourage you, don't start trying to do your Bible reading through your phone because you're already distracted, all right? So, oh, well, just, it's so easy. I get it, but you're already distracted, so you're going to add the Bible to your source of distraction and think it's going to work. It's just not going to work. And so let me encourage you, don't start it in your phone. By the way, if you're very disciplined, the phone is where it works for you, that's fine. Go ahead and do it that way. Um, but the point is that a lot of people are getting through their Bible reading, waiting to get to the next app that they plan on opening. Okay, I've got to finish this, so now I can open up this app, and you're living for that app. And so, again, it's a matter of priority. Um, this is the only book that God commands that we read. The only book. There's not another one. All right, you're not, God's not going to give you another holy book. It's like, oh, you really need to read that one. You know, people, uh, we have our devotionals. We, we, we give them out here at the church, and you're not commanded to read that. It's like, well, I don't have time for my devotional and Bible reading. Then read the Bible. Read the Bible. Um, like, well, if I'm, I have to read this blog post or whatever, read the Bible. Oh, I have to listen to this. Read the Bible. It's amazing how many spiritual things we can do and not read the Bible. The devil is not afraid of a Christian that's not praying and reading their Bible. Oh, but I'm doing spiritual things. W with what power? What do you have? What have you received to give? And so you're not hearing the voice of God. Now, I want to remind you from this passage in Hebrews, when he's talking about hearing the voice of God, he's saying the Holy Spirit is given. When we think about or the Holy Spirit, what he's provided within the context of Scripture, within the words of Scripture, we are hearing his voice as the Holy Spirit who resides in you as testifying of these things to be true. This is what's provided. He's literally teaching you in something louder than an audible voice. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you God's word. Number uh, two, uh, we have the servants. We have servants. God speaks to us not just through scriptures, but to servants. Um, now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the treasure, I'm sorry, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ.
that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So here's what God says. One of the things that happens, and so we understand God is giving you a sure foundation within his word. But one of the resources you're provided to not be cast to and fro is Ephesians 4, 11, the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. This is what God has provided so that way we're not swept around everywhere. There, there's an abundance of them, but he's described within the local church, right? And so understanding this, he says, I've given you something so that way I can guide you, not me, but I'm talking about God can guide you into what you're supposed to be believing and doing. And he's put people in your life that will help you with those things. That way you're not children tossed to and fro, carried about. And so the whole point of this is to make you into what you're supposed to be. So, um, so when we think about what we're doing as a church, this is why it's important that our services have a, uh, a primary focus on the Word of God. Now, um, I, I'm not against necessarily, necessarily, uh, dramas, okay? Dramas, uh, dramas have their place. I think some people are really good at that kind of stuff. You know, the reason I don't do dramas, I'm a terrible actor. I really am. I couldn't, I couldn't try. I, I used to, I remember doing a skit one time, and uh, I was, I was like, working at a camp, and uh, I want to say, like, the, the acting was unusual because it was, it was for a deaf camp. And so, like, so I had to, like, really act out and, and sign while we're doing this stuff. And so, anyways, halfway through, the guy that's working with me is like, just go, man. You're, this isn't going to work. <laughs> and so I just, I couldn't do it. I failed at my skit. When you get, when you get kicked out of a, um, of a um, opportunity where you're a volunteer, at a very low level, and uh, you're like, you're not even good enough for that. <laughs> so acting is not my thing, but you know what? So I, I get it. So drama, I mean, people will, it's a way to, it's, it's an expression of these things. Music is that type of ex thing. It's an expression, an art form to explain the truth. And so anyways, with that, the reality is those, those you might even enjoy those. There might be like paintings of it. So I get it. But there's nothing that can take the place of Bible preaching. That you can't when it comes to church. That is the primary focus, and it ought to always remain the focus of the church, especially as it meets together. And so, with that, that means the service ought to be in favor of the Word of God. That's why we sing when we sing. You know, we'll make changes. One of the things I realized um, a couple weeks ago is like, wow, we've had the same order of service for like three years. We haven't touched it. And, we, and people, you just know when to sit down, stand up, when you're going to sing, when you close your book. Um, we, just, we just know, and so we'll like, let's change it up a little bit. And so the goal of that is to mix you up so you have to think about what you're doing. And so with, with that, and we, we, I, I think specials are helpful, but I also think singing is helpful. And so if you, as a congregation, sing right before preaching, you're, you're preparing your heart, you're getting it ready before the Lord. And so anyways, there, there's, a, there's a, a favor towards the word of God within the, within the church. And the other thing is, when you come to church, that means you should be expecting to hear, to learn, to receive. The Bible tells us, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so when we come to this, we're coming with the expectation, God, we need you to give us what you're providing. When you come to church, I hope that there's a mindset, a desire, a spirit about you that says, I need to hear from God. Not, I need to learn something new. Isn't that, isn't that the response of the philosophers on Mars Hill? I will hear the again of this matter. This, this sounds great. Oh, this is wonderful. This is great stuff. This is very interesting and good information. Listen, the philosophers who are rejecting of Christ have that same mindset. But when we come to church, we're asking, God, I need something from you. Would you give me what I need? Not just another piece of information. And so we're seeking God. We're seeking God. Learn to listen to God when you come to church. Number three is by his spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that, ye, that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. his. Now, here's, he's making a point in the book of Romans. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. It dwells within you. There is an aspect of testimony of your spirit that bears witness with God. That is a, is, he's going to function in a manner that's going to speak to you. And again, it's not going to be in the audible sounds of God, okay? When it comes to this, what he's addressing here is taking what we know from Scripture, the way he has guided us. There's bearing uh, in, in your spirit witness in the directions in which you're supposed to take. We understand something. For instance, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, the concept for a lot of us would be, okay, well, then what that means is I'm going to pray that God gives you wisdom. Hopefully, I'll be smarter, and I'll just know, I'll just know how to do things. 
But the reality is the Holy Spirit of God will direct you in those things. And by the way, bearing witness with his word, right? That's what you're lining up to it. And so you need word. Now, by the way, that also means that you need counselors because sometimes there's, um, there's the counterfeits, isn't there? Uh, for those things which God would provide, God would speak, the reality is there's also the counterfeit. Where are those counterfeits? Sometimes it's just your flesh. Like, I just, I really want to do this. Um, I remember in, in high school, and I know one of my kids is in here, so I'll be careful with how I say this, but um, I had just started going to church, and um, I just, actually, I'm sorry, I had just gotten saved. Maybe. No, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going back there. I, I wasn't saved. It was about a year before I got saved. And um, in any ways, I was, I was dating a girl in the youth group because I knew that was, you know, dating girls in public school was bad, and I needed to date girls in church. So I dated all of them. That <laughs> was like the, the, the thing. And uh, that was bad. Lily, that was bad. Okay. So, um, so anyways, with that, my, my youth leader comes to me. We're out, I was helping him out with something. He, he made us work. That's the thing. He's like, you want to hang out? We're going to work because men work. Okay. So we work with them. And when we were working, um, he said, you know, this girl that you're dating, it's not a, it's not a good idea. And, and I said this. We prayed about it, and uh, this, is, this is what God wants us to do. Well, now, remind you, I wasn't saved. God wasn't telling me this. And I had prayed myself into a decision that was apart from the will, and more importantly, the written word of God. I was defying several things there. And so with that, though, I had a peace about it. In fact, we used to use the phrase, I've got peace about this. Listen, when somebody comes and tells you something is right because they've got peace about it, and they're counselors, which God has said, God has said that there is safety in a multitude of counselors, and the counselors are like, no, not a good idea, then, then we are, uh, we're going back to what the scriptures say, don't we, about the safety in the multitude of counselors, the clear direction of scriptures and what God is providing. So we have to be careful in the way that we're discerning those things. But remember that God does provide. We have to be careful. If you're not walking with God, if you're not spending time with him, you're not in his word, you're not in prayer, you're not in church, you're not, you're not, not faithfully obeying, and you're thinking, you know, I think God really wants me to do this you can pretty much attest to the fact that, that unless that thing that God wants you to do is get right with him, then, um, then it's probably not him. It may be something else and perhaps could even be a counterfeit of, the, of Satan himself trying to direct you. And the point is, it needs to be by obedience and faith to God. In the passage of Hebrews here, when he addresses this, he talks about the fact that they, they had this evil heart because of their unbelief. And so he's saying, don't harden yourself, believe him, trust him specifically uh, in regards to what he's saying. In other words, when he speaks, you listen to that voice. The voice specifically is provided through scriptures. Um, now, what's happened, though, what happens to us, and here's, here's what I'm trying to warn you of, is that you could refuse the voice of God. You can refuse it. Now, how can you refuse it? In this passage, harden not your hearts. He's telling you this. He tells you multiple times. He said back then, that testimony of the Old Testament well, so you can remember something. Don't do what they did, and you today don't do the same thing. And that's this. Don't harden your hearts. Now, how, how does this happen? A couple ways. In the book of Zechariah, for instance, um, the Bible talks about the warning that he had provided by the prophets, that they, had, they would not hearken. In other words, they didn't listen. And that they would turn, uh, they had turned their back, and they had pulled their shoulder. The idea is that somebody tried talking to them, and then they walked away, and then when they tried to get a hold of them, they pulled their shoulder. In other words, they were making their way away from God. What are they doing? They're refusing the voice of God. God is instructing something. Obey it. One of the things that happens is we refuse to hear. Some of you all have in your mind already, this is certain things I'm going to do for God, and there's certain things I'm not going to do. And by the way, we don't usually say that list, like, I'm just not going to do certain things for our, for our Savior. We don't usually say that, but you've already had in you an evil heart of not believing that God can give you victory over certain things, that God could not, you couldn't be satisfied unless he would provide in a certain way. You have all these ideas in your mind, and what you're saying here is, I will not believe God as he has given us, and because of that, you will not have the power that God wants for you. And in fact, he's going to describe that your evil heart is going to have evil consequences, destruction that will be there. And so don't refuse. Uh, number two, you can pretend, you can pretend, um, one, the, we would call this hypocrisy when we come to church and we have this mindset that we're going to look good, we're going to sound good, and uh, yeah, everything's fine. You know, amen, brother. Um, in, in 1 Kings chapter 13, an example is given where a prophet goes up north, tells the king, hey, this is it. Um, here's what's going to happen. And um, God has said, don't, don't stay up there. 
the king offered him like stuff to eat with him, all that kind of stuff. He said, nope, God said to go home and not stop for anybody. On his way home, another prophet in, in uh, 1 Kings 13, verse 18, stopped him and said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. Now, this is an older prophet saying, bring him back with thee into thine house that he may eat bread and drink water. Next few words says, but he lied unto him. He lied. So listen, there, there, is, uh, there is the pretending aspect. This is what God wants. Um, number three, there's a rebellion. When it comes to, um, to the word of God, I want to remind you that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know, you know certain things are right. You know certain things are wrong. And you're saying, I'm just going to do what's wrong. I know what God says, but I'm just going to do it. And it's probably going to turn out better because this is what I like the most. And if, as long as this is what I like the most, then this is what's going to be good for me. Um, one, of the, one of the examples is money. You know, like, hey, if I have more money, then that would be good. I know if I could obey God, I, I wouldn't have the money. And so money would make me happy, and obeying God wouldn't make me happy. And we don't say it necessarily that way, but we will pursue the one and we know that we are doing something wrong and we're willing to do the wrong against God to get what we want because we feel that would make us happy. It's sourced in a heart of unbelief and it's a heart that is evil, one of rebellion. And so we know something is, is wrong. We do it anyways. We believe the lie. We pursued, we pursued against And By the way, rebellion is defined as the believing of a lie, which is interesting. The idea of the evil, it's there. Um, and something that we do uh, against what, what is truth. We're rebelling against God, literally rebelling against truth. And so what you need is you need to have a desire, a desire for the word of God. You should want God's leading. You should want God's direction. You should want God's provision. And unfortunately, we're okay without it. How much did you want God's word this week? Now, more often than not, um, it, within the spiritual realm of community, people, people love pursuing those special occasions where God's going to speak in some special way. What I mean by speaking is, like, okay, I'm, I'm confused on this level of wisdom or direction, and I'm going to pray for that, that God will provide. But they have not desired God's word. They've not desired prayer. They've not desired faithfulness. They've not desired, but now they want that. The other thing that we'll desire is that we'll want the servants. We want the servants. We want that. We want somebody to tell us this. You know, I, I love coming to church. Um, I I enjoy it. By the way, I'm not saying, like, stop coming, but when you go, I, I love to hear preaching. But the reality is I enjoy that because who doesn't like to be fed? As long as it's good, you know. And so, um, so I, there's, there's been things. And I'm not, like, when I'm at home, my wife doesn't usually usually feed me. And so, uh, but, but anyways, but I, I love having that food brought out there in front of me, and she sets it on the table and, and gets all this. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's delicious. It's great. And... Um, and every now and then, I might like to make my food, but most of the time, I just enjoy getting it. But when you have to go and get the food, and you have to do this every day, every single day, you got to cook it, prepare it, and then it provides. It's not as special as others, but this is what's most consistent, and this is what's going to keep you alive as a Christian. You need that desire of God, and you should be pursuing that every single day. Hearers of the word, not um, doers of the word, not hearers only. Uh, inquire the scriptures, find out what God has for you. Let me encourage you, when you're asking for God's leading, one of the things that you'll find is that when you pursue scriptures, God will provide direction. God will provide those things. Um, also, uh, honestly evaluate your heart when you're doing these things. When, one of the things we can do is we can trap ourselves into what we want to do because we are not honest about it. You know, this is, I think this is what God wants. Well, we're apart from God's word. And let me encourage you something. God is speaking. God is speaking. And so when I, and the reason I'm using the word speaking is because we're, we're kind of, uh, we, we, we can make it very academic, words. We're, we're familiar with words and, and orders and letters and dates and all. Okay, I understand that, but this is God, and he is speaking to you. Do you take it that way? When we talk about the word of God, he's speaking to you. What's your Bible reading like? Let me encourage you. Be in the word. Be in the word. Spend some time with God. I mean, literally spend time with him, not just about him. All right? That's it. That's it for tonight. Um, no, I'll probably preach one more message about the voice of God, just um, some, some practical standpoints later on. Um, I, there's a whole other section I wanted to cover with this, but we'll, we'll get to that later. All right, let's go ahead and uh, we'll spend some time in uh, prayer just after our offering. If we could take our offering at this time, we'll do that. And then uh, any prayer requests, we'll spend some time praying for these.